The Luke Littler effect of a 16-year-old wonder kid. The story was absolute fairy tale stuff. And we probably didn't anticipate quite how big it was going to get. The World Championship is our marquee event. If you said to people, give me words to describe the World Darts Championship, they'd say Alexandra Palace and Christmas. Am I right in saying that it was the most watched non-football yeah, event? in the history of Sky Sports. I mean, that includes Ashes, Ryder Cup, Masters Golf, anything that Sky has ever shown. That's great, but it's where do we go next? Really great to have you in here. Thank you so much for joining us. No better time to have this conversation around darts. No, it's been great. I mean, thanks for having me. It's been, it's been a great few weeks. It's been a great few months. I mean, to be honest with you, where we are now is somewhere we probably didn't envisage being a couple of months ago. But every now and again, you get an opportunity and it's on you to take it. So it's, it's an exciting time. It's probably the only place we could start. You know, normally we always go, <laughs> tell me the backstory and mm. how do we get here? But Let's ride the the wave, which was, in my mind, you may correct me, the incredible world championships at Christmas mm. for darts and what that's done for you as chief executive of the PDC yeah. and the wider sport as well. I think if you look at the trajectory that darts has been on from a growth perspective over the last 20 years, then you look at certain landmarks along the way and, and pinpoint them as being the reason for certain things to be elevated. Um, you know, if you look in more recent times, what Fallon Sherrick did uh, back in 2019, if you look at the Taylor v. Barneveld final at the Circus Tavern in 2007. But then if you take this year's World Championship, the Luke Littler story, the general level of interest in the event, regardless, uh, culminating in, of course, that magnificent final with, with, with the record breaking viewing figures, it feels like it's given darts an extra level, an extra, an extra, uh, a step change, an opportunity for us to move, move beyond the environment in which we were operating before. What do you think drove it for this uh, event? There was obviously one key person yeah. that may have driven that, but was there anything else collectively that had such a profound impact on the tournament? The World Championships it, it, it is an iconic event. And if you look at iconic events and the reasons why they're iconic, often they're to do with the location, and the time of year. And we're very fortunate in, with Alexandra Palace, it's such a, a, a famous, loved venue. And the time of year at Christmas, there's so many great factors around Christmas with social elements and people's viewing habits. And they all combine to make, a, it's a perfect storm of an event. And then when you add in a factor such as a 16 year old wonder kid, who the whole country and, and in many cases, or, you know, the whole world becomes captivated by, then, it just gives you so many, so much elevation and so many opportunities to to break into new markets, into new demographics and things like that. So it was just a, a coming together of a number of factors, some which were predictable and others which, which came out of nowhere. You mentioned the record-breaking viewing figures. Am I right in saying that it was the most watched non-football yeah, event? Yeah, in the history of, in the Sky, history Sports. of Sky Yeah, I mean, that includes Ashes, Ryder Cup, Masters Golf, Cricket World Cup, anything that Sky has ever shown that isn't football. It, it was a higher viewing figure than, than any of those achieved. So that's great, but it's where do we go next? Because it's no good just saying, okay, great, you nearly got 5 million viewers for the World Championship final. We've got to carry that on. And so far with the Premier League darts, the start of the Premier League darts, the opening few weeks we've had so far, we've been doing that. You know, the figures are well up on, on previous years, which shows that although people may be engaged with darts for the first time at Christmas, and it might have been a, a viewing habit they weren't expecting to get into, it's carried on. And that's really encouraging for us. You mentioned there's a, there's a knowledge of the continuation, but yeah. why is it going to be different now for the sport? Well, it started off with a number of big stories of of high ranked players losing quite early, which you know is always really good for the sports pages. It doesn't necessarily get you into that new audience. But then the Luke Littler effect of a 16 year old wonder kid um, it, and, and the way in which he conducted himself was really positive as well. And that helped endear him to people. He came across as a likable lad, came across as a, every estate in the UK has got a Luke Littler living on it. A normal 16 year old boy just doing his thing. He's a gamer. He's on social media. He's got mates who he hangs out with. He's finished his GCSEs. He's just a normal kid, you know. Oh, except he can get to the final of the World Darts Championship and win two hundred grand. Yeah. You know, it's the 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 story was was absolute fairy tale stuff, and we probably didn't anticipate 
quite how big it was going to get or how far he was going to go. You know, he won his first couple of games. He said, oh, this kid's good. The World Championship's divided into three stages. You've got the first round before Christmas. Then you've got the middle rounds up between Christmas and New Year and then the quarter semis and finals from January the 1st onwards. So it's only really, can you get to the new year? If you can get to the new year, that's that's when the big money comes, the big viewing figures come, the, the big attention and everything like that. And when he got through to that last eight, can this kid actually go on and win it? You know, amazing. Like when you look at Emma Raducanu winning the US Open or Wayne Rooney doing what he did as a kid, you know, these things that young sports people did and they capture the public's imagination and people enjoy seeing young young people doing well, at, particularly at sports. You know, he was, he was likeable, he was successful, he took it all in his stride uh, and people cottoned onto the story. The media were, were, you know, by and large good with him. You know, there was a couple of silly little stories but we, we learned to manage that. He's got... Yeah. Fortunately, he's got good parents. He's got good manager, and we, you know we were involved as well, and and we we kind of we kind of made sure that the direction in which Luke's story was taken was a positive one. He was very uh, very good, wasn't he, in the junior circuit? Yeah, so did, did that wipe give, the floor? Yeah, yeah. did yeah. that give you any time to prepare for a what he was bit, about but, to but achieve? Other young players have been have been successful at that level as well, and then the transition to being a full-time professional can be a lot longer. Don't forget in darts, it's not necessarily like in football, say, where if you're not first-team regular at 21, then you're considered to be on the scrap heap or you've got to drop down a couple of levels yeah. or anything like that. You know, darts is a long career. It can go on for 30 years from, from where Luke is now, maybe longer. There was no immediate pressure on him to go and achieve big, big things in the adult world. It was more a case of can he compete, can he cope in that environment? And he proved very quickly that he could. Yeah. And then he also proved that Nothing scared him, nothing phased him, and he was better than, than most of the players he was playing. Do you feel he had, you you now have um, this kind of duty of care to now manage mm. him and the hype around him? And also, interestingly, you know, one of your thoughts, the knock on, on the players mm. in and around the tour, because it yeah. won't just be him that gets all this hype now, it is the added exposure yeah. that they will receive as well. Look, he's, he's great for the sport because of the extra eyeballs and attention that he's bringing to the sport. And most people have cottoned onto that within, within darts. You know, you'd have to be a bit daft not to realise that. At first, there was no, look, nobody's been in a you know said anything inappropriate or or, or not nice to, to Luke because generally they're a good they're a good bunch of players and they're not like that you know but there was maybe a little bit of unease a, a teenager coming in and doing what he was doing and various players made comments about you know he should just be left alone to play darts and things like that and it's like actually he, he was just being left alone to play darts and look how well he was doing at it you know okay he did a few interviews but. It wasn't, wasn't Luke's fault that every piece of clickbait and every headline was about him. And it, it, he, he just ignored it. He just got on with it. You know, he wasn't going, going home and sweating over stuff like that. Mm. We put security on him to manage it. There was paparazzi hanging around outside the event hotel for him every day. So we, we, we you know, quickly learned to manage that. As I say, work with his manager, work with his parents and, and made decisions that were right for Luke with Luke's full involvement. You know, he wasn't waking up in the morning being told, right, you're doing this, you're doing that. It was, right, Luke, what do you think about tomorrow? Do you want a day off? The opportunity to do this? When do you want to practice? He's not really a big practicer, um, yeah. you know, which is a bit, <laughs> yeah. a bit weird. But, you know, it, look, he does enough and he's obviously very, very naturally talented. But it quickly gathered legs, it grew, gathered momentum, and we had to learn how to manage it, you know, in, an, in, a, in a, a high-pressure environment which was a challenge for us because although we've had players come through before who have captured the, the public's imagination, nobody's really uh, captured as many different types of the public's imagination as Luke did. You know, Fallon Sherrick got into the women's media and the lifestyle media and, and, and different different areas, but Luke just took it took it to another area, another level. What's it like then within that circuit? Is there the collective understanding that while this may seem very centred on one person, and this is from your side as well mm. as the player's side, that this is actually a very, very good thing for the sport. Because with all this attention, yes, yeah. on his social media, yeah. you know, followers, etc., we're talking about the likelihood of increased media deals, mm. better sponsorship opportunities, better geographical yeah. opportunities you can take this to, you know, Absolutely. new places. Yeah, yeah. Is, there, is there that understanding? It must excite you. Do the players... They appreciate this as well. They, they do. And also, don't forget, that, that was happening anyway. Yeah. You know, what the current group of elite players have, have done over the last five or six years is take darts to that next level. Um, you know, if I look at our, our sort of top four over the last few years of Van Gerwen, Smith, Wright, Price, that's 
kind of been our equivalent of Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, Murray in tennis. You know, they're, they're the ones you put on the posters. They're the ones who, who sell the tickets off the back of, of them being there. But what's good is there's another level of player beyond that now who people know. And with darts, traditionally, people maybe came to an event and only knew one or two players. You know, they didn't know some of the lesser ranked players or the, the lesser well-exposed players. But that's different now because of social media and because of the profile of the sport. If you're ranked anywhere down to about 20, 30 in the world, people know who you are. And, you, you know, you're, you, you've are you got a good social media following. You get asked for selfies and, or, you know, autographs in the street and, and you, you can go and get sponsors and you can be a, what a top sportsman's supposed to be. Mm. Um, so that was happening anyway. Um, and the top players were, were earning a good living before Luke Littler came along, yeah. you know, but he, he's just given us the opportunity to do things a little bit a little bit differently um, to, what's, to what's happened before. But you don't grow the sport off the back of, of one person. Yeah. You know, it has to be the whole package. What were the, I mean, just out of interest, you break the record at over 4 million in mm. Sky. What was, how did that compare to previous years in numbers of, what would well, you expect for? Well, we would generally have been getting about one and a half million for the World Championship final. So it was pretty much three times that figure. And one and a half million still still massive, right? I mean, we were we were consistently the only or the top non football property in Sky's uh, top fifty viewing figures of the year. Really, you know. So the World Championship final has has been for many years one of Sky's like biggest marquee you know event day broadcast days of the year start of the year everyone yeah it's a build up's been it's over the culmination christmas. of christmas yeah. isn't it it's literally it's like yeah. the end of christmas you yeah. know forget taking your decorations down it's like the world championship <laughs> final is the end of christmas so people watch it you know in 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 big numbers uh, but we were hitting one and a half million with days to go with the event and it was like this is just growing and what are the kind of you know, business of sport what are the kind of um sponsorships and stuff that you bring into events like that. And I do want to move on and ask more broadly about yeah. PDC as well. But for something like the World Championship, does that drive a lot of the commercial uh, attraction to the sport that then provides the opportunities for the competitions outside of it? Yeah, the World Championship is our marquee event. So that's where people who don't engage with darts regularly, that's probably the only thing they'll know. You know, Ali Pali at Christmas, yeah. going back to being synonymous with a time of year and a venue. You know, if you said to people, give me words to describe the World Darts Championship, they'd say Alexandra Palace and Christmas mm. because, the, you know, they're, they're, they're obvious things to, to associate with it. The Luke Littler effect on sponsorship is is an interesting one because clearly with his age profile, he doesn't suit every potential sponsor, um, you know, and that's something to, to bear in mind. So he there's not necessarily a huge correlation between increased sponsorship interest and Luke, um, you know, but generally if he's bringing more eyeballs to the sport, mm. then that will that will perk the interest of sponsors. Look, we've always been strong in certain fields, which aren't too difficult to work out what they are. But I have to say what Paddy Power did around this year's World Championship took it to a new level. You know, the level of engagement, uh, activation, their content was spot on every single time. You know, they really they really knew how to, how to hit the right note and connect with darts fans. It's important when you've got a sponsor that they put as much into the event as you do because it's only with a collaborative approach that you're going to deliver a return for them. It's not a branding exercise anymore. You know, those days are gone of just putting your name mm. in, in big letters above the board. Um, How are they measuring um, success across those? Yeah, I mean, so you'd, you'd get your media value from a from a, a research agency, and then they would look at account signups, uh, you know, the amount of bets that were placed on darts, the amount of interaction they got on social media anecdotal feedback you know th there's all sorts of different metrics and different things are important to different people but um i think with with paddies they were fortunate in so much as aligned with the event during a year when it was elevated to the next yeah. level but in the same vein they were part of the reason for that elevation so let's use the hype and uh, attention that came from the world championship and take it into just a bit of a conversation about the wider PDC calendar yeah. and the organization as well, which you head. Can you give, without me putting any words in your mouth, mm. just a little bit of an overview of what the PDC is, the responsibilities that you have, and then yeah. the calendar that comes with it? Yeah, I mean, the first thing to note really is that we're not a governing body. We're a promotions company. So we, we promote the global professional pyramid of darts, which is everything from the world championship that we've that we've talked about all the way down to development tour events that 
ironically, Luke Little is no longer eligible to play him because he's too highly ranked in the world, but <laughs> they're for 16 to 23 year old players. Um, and ar around that, you know, we have women's events, even though all our, all our events are actually open to men and women, but we do have some women only events. And then uh, affiliated tours around the world in America, Scandinavia, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. We try to be 360 degrees of darts once you've decided to play on a competitive level beyond your local environment. If you want to get into the pyramid of darts where you can reach the top, then the PDC will offer you that opportunity to do so pretty much wherever you are. And that's something that's only come about over the last 15 or so years. Previously, we were very UK focused. Uh, we didn't really do a lot overseas. We didn't have a huge amount of overseas broadcast. Didn't have many foreign players, a couple of Dutch players, and that was about it. You know, but but um, you know, it's it's pleasing to see that that's all changing. Is that because the sport just isn't as widely accessible or recognised in other areas? I think the sport's played globally. You know, a dartboard is a dartboard is a dartboard wherever you are in the world, and people can engage with it on a fun level and a social level anywhere in the world. But it's that education process of taking it from being a sport you play with your mates in the pub or in your garage or in your bedroom or whatever to a sport that's competitive and a sport that can offer you opportunities to earn money and go and make a living. And that doesn't suit everybody. And the beauty of darts is that anybody can play it socially and it doesn't matter if you're no good or not. You know, if you look at flight club and places like that, after people go, they can't even hit the board, but they enjoy playing. Whereas if you look at golf or tennis or yeah. sports, like, they're just too difficult. Yeah. Some people just, you, you just cannot play them. Whereas with darts, anybody can pick up a dart and throw it. So that's something that's a, a big asset for us and something that we'll, you know, that we, that we try to harness because it's, a, it's, it's the fun that comes with mm. it as well. Does darts have an image problem? It probably did, you know, and, and it's something we've worked very hard on over the last 20 years or so to, to move away from that dated preconception of darts. Um, you know, if you look at the profile of our top players now, they, they're younger, they, they take more care over their appearance and their, their lifestyle and, and the way that they manage themselves because it's an intense schedule. You're traveling constantly, you're in hotels, you're in uh, you're overseas you're doing media you're doing sponsor commitments you're doing what golfers tennis players formula 1 drivers you you're doing what they're doing you know you might not be quite you know every case at the, that level of awareness or popularity but you're certainly a lot further down that line than you were 10 years ago so we've worked very hard and the players have too on repositioning the perception of of darts in in the market and i think people who are coming into darts now over the last decade for the first time they don't hold those those dated preconceptions that that people who know what darts was like in the eighties and nineties, or even before yeah. then, you know what what they thought. Premier League darts structures how tournaments play yeah. at the moment. It's eight players yeah. moving around, four wild cards, yeah. four seeds. How does that work? The Premier League is essentially the aim for the for us in the Premier League is to have the best players in the world in it, obviously. So we take the top four from the order of merit after the World Championship and then four invites. Now, generally those invites are, de are determined by what's happened over the previous 12 months. Did you win a major event? Is your ranking at a certain level? You know, th those are the main criteria really. In some years, it's quite easy to pick the eight. It was quite easy this year. There's no one really who could who could argue too heavily that they should have been included and aren't. Other years it's more difficult, you know. So it, so it swings and roundabouts with that. But the the beauty of where we are now in terms of strength and depth is you know that whichever eight you're going to deliver, they're going to be able to deliver entertainment and top class performances on a week in week out basis. You know, even if even if you're struggling a couple of weeks in a row, there's nothing to stop you going out there and winning the following week. So it's um it's it's exciting. It it means that. With having a winner every night of Premier League darts, the, the phrase we use, every match matters. You know, previously under the old format, if you lost in the first, if you lost your first game or you, your match in the first six or seven weeks, which some players had done, you knew then you couldn't reach the playoffs. So your motivation was down. The chances of you winning further matches was was limited. Whereas at least now, if you are struggling, you've still got the following week where you could be the nightly winner and win a £10,000 bonus. So the incentive and the motivation is still high. But so saying, in the 20-year history of Premier League darts, the format's changed about six or seven times because we have to keep it fresh. We're going to the same cities every year, generally with 75% of the same players that we took the year before. So we don't just want to deliver a product that people say, oh, it's the same. I've, I've seen this, I've mm. seen this, I've seen this. So we'll freshen it up you know, when we feel the time's right. If you're not a top 10 player, 
what's the the financial viability of a career in darts? Is it a, is it accessible um, and able to support players who want to really push that career through yeah. the sport? So we've got 128 full time professionals, what we call our tour card holders. So they're the players who are in that main bracket draw for every pro tour event. In the same way that you'd see at Wimbledon, there's 128. So it, it works in, in in that single elimination format. We, from the research that we've done with a players association, we, we believe about two thirds of them make their living exclusively from playing darts, whether that's prize money, exhibitions, sponsorship, whatever else they do. And about a third ha have to have employment in, in other areas. We want to get away from that. We want, I mean, we've added £750,000 to the Pro Tour prize money this year. We want to give every one of those 128 enough opportunities and enough prize money that they can play darts mm. exclusively and, and professionally. How do you do that? Just increase the prize money. If you're a player now, you've got 94 tournaments over over a two-year period as a tour card holder, either qualifiers or direct into the main draw. So you've got plenty of opportunities on an almost weekly basis to go and earn money. If you're not earning money, you have to ask yourself, are you doing the right thing? You know, it's all very well saying I won my tour card, but if I won my tour card, I'm probably spending 20 to 25,000 pounds a year on expenses to play the tour. And that's with us we've taken away entry fees. So there's no no cost to entry, but you've obviously got to travel, you've got to eat, you've got to stay in a hotel. If, if you can't sustain that, then you probably need to look at whether you'd be better off playing on our challenge tour, which is the, the second level tour for semi-professional players and, and maybe playing other darts tournaments. It swings and roundabouts. I mean, when you say outside the top 10, yes, certainly if you're 11 in the world, you're earning a good, you're earning a good living. You know, I would say the- Top 30. The, the, yeah, the to well. essentially the top half of the, the top half of the tour are earning a good living, you know, the 64. And it, it obviously tapers down. But the main thing from our perspective is to give those players opportunities. If we're doing that, then we're doing our job. It's up to them to go and play well enough yeah. to, to earn money and do theirs. And have you seen a spike in your revenues as PDC to be able to then increase that prize money? Because it's yeah. got to come from somewhere, uh, Absolutely. Right? You know, the profit that we make from the, the big events, such as the World Championship and the Premier League darts, uh, they're invested further down the pyramid as well. You know, the Challenge Tour, the Development Tour, the Women's Series, the Affiliated Tours. You know, the, the prize money in those events is over a million pounds a year. So that's money that's going into giving players the opportunity to to bolster their chance to become a professional. You know, they go and play in Q school in January, very limited number, about 5% of the players who, who play in Q school end up with a tour card, even even less. So it's a, it's a real dog eat dog world. It's not easy to become a full-time dart player. And then when you've become a full-time dart player, you know, you're not guaranteed to be earning a, a massive living either. So it's, it's tough and only the strongest will survive, but that is the nature of professional sport. It's not a, you know, it's kind of, it's not really a handout situation. It's you've, you've got to earn it. Do you see, we touched on it at the beginning, but you know, I'm talking much broader than one person here. Do you see the increased celebritization of players now, as we see in so many sports where it's not necessarily just team, it's, it's individual brand that's built out mm. of that as a huge opportunity for you to leverage um, the growth of the sport in the wider, wider sporting ecosystem. Yeah, I think years ago, uh, uh, as I sort of referenced before, players were, people would come to the darts and they wouldn't really know who was playing. And that might still be true if you go to the World Championship first round and there's a qualifier from <clears throat> Malaysia or wherever and you've never heard of him. That's fair enough. But that's only the same as if you go to the first round of Wimbledon. You probably haven't heard of who you're seeing there or you go and watch the golf and it's a 7.30 tee off time. You might not know who that is either. So that's the same in every sport. The key is to make sure that the, the major players are, are well known. And as I say, the players have worked very hard on their brands. You know, if you look at the colors, the logos, the walk-on songs, in some cases, the hairstyles, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the players are brands in their own right. And they're savvy enough now to be able to monetize that through merchandise, replica wear, the dart, you know, the darts that they, that they play with and things like that, because they understand their own, their own value. Um, and in the same vein, that's how we market the events as well. But the beauty of it is that we're selling the event. We're not selling the player. You know, if, if, a, if a top player was to fall over tomorrow and break their arm and be out of the event, the event would go on. You know, if you look at the fundamental difference with boxing, if a boxer does that, the show's off. You know, it's, it's very hard to get a late replacement in boxing to just come in and, and, and keep the show at the same level. But the beauty of the darts is that the, the event is the main driver. People are going because of the environment, the atmosphere, the chance to see some top players. They don't really mind who wins and who loses, major plus. So nobody really goes home disappointed. And if they're a massive Michael Van Gerwen fan, but Michael Van Gerwen didn't play because he's on the next day instead, they still had a good yeah. time.
You're, so you don't own the venues that you play in. Do you have agreements with them that you take a certain you know, receipt of, I don't know, the wider hospitality pieces? Yeah. Are you able to, because it's such a fun social occasion now driven by the sport. Yeah, I mean, is look, there an agreement you have? There, there's no doubt. Our secondary spend that we, that we take with us to venues is higher than pretty much any promoter out there, you know, because the people are on a social. They're, they're there and they have a drink and they have something to eat and they're, they're, they're there for a long time as well. It's a four hour show. So it's longer than a lot of a lot of other gigs or, or, or concerts that are beyond at venues. Great outfits. Great, Great outfits, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's difficult with arenas. Look, they have very tight commercial deals with their pouring rights yeah. suppliers and things like that. So you, you don't always benefit directly, but you certainly get indirect benefits. I think we have good negotiating powers when it comes to, to hiring venues. So um, we're, we're an event that venues want to have. It's good for their profile. They've got huge global TV coverage through us. They know that it's going to be an event that will give people a positive reaction to go into that venue. You know, when if you're a venue, you want people to come and enjoy themselves in your on your property, um, and you know that that Premier League darts, if we, if we took that for example, w- would be one that that would tick so many boxes. Yeah. Talks about TV rights. What about wider media rights and the opportunities presented by so many different channels now mm. to create and distribute content? How do you how do you work with those? Yeah, so I mean, away from our from our standard broadcast arrangements, which in the UK are with Sky Sports and ITV, um, then we have we have an agreement with Stats Perform and Sport Radar for our data and for our, our watch and bet rights. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> streaming our own streaming platform, our own DTC platform, PDC TV, where we stream a lot of our second tier events, our European Tour and our and our Pro Tour events, and we try to make sure that we cater for both types of audience and what I mean by that is the audience who sit on the sofa and watch darts at Christmas because they're fed up of talking to their family and we want to cater for people who are dyed in the wool darts fans and know our rankings and know our formats and know who's going to be qualifying for this event and things like that and and, and that's quite difficult because they've, they've got very different agendas. But what about then also the younger fan now we're looking because mm. I, I get a lot of my um, darts content or you know throughout the year especially yeah. on Twitter yeah, accounts are really yeah. good at providing the clips and yeah. the big checkouts and all of that so I think that's really good engagement so how do you, do you use TikTok Twitter yeah we, I mean we use every platform that's out there but we have to be careful as well not to be um, too generic with it you know our, our, our media team are very good at understanding what content works on YouTube what content works on Twitter what content works on Instagram TikTok and it's often different formats of the same content because people want to consume different uh, durations of that content or they want to con- you know want it to be filmed in a slightly different way and, and you can see from the numbers what works and what doesn't work so we tailor our content based on the platform that we're delivering it to but also it's important that if we go out there and you know if we do a day's filming that might cost us quite a lot of money or be quite difficult to organize that we have to maximize the return on that so if we look at the dart show which is our magazine show if we look at twitter if we look at youtube if we look at instagram can we produce four different pieces of content from one piece of filming. And in doing so, can we hit four different audiences? Because invariably, somebody who's watching a video piece on an Instagram reel probably isn't watching our magazine show on Sky Sports. Yeah. You know, it's a different demographic. So you have to be you have to be very conscious of, of delivering the right content to the right audience. It's understanding your fan, right? And totally. as you said, just totally. being able to speak yeah. to them in so many different ways yeah. is going to benefit you no, across all of the... Knowing who they are, we've platforms. grown our database hugely uh, over the last few years now. You know, we've got over a million on, on our database and we know who these people are and we can tailor our messaging to them, which is a position we weren't in before. Yeah. Let's pivot it to the personal side. So, you know, it sounds like a pretty great job. Um <laughs> How did you get here? What's the experience in sport? Uh, well, I've worked for Barry Hearn for 22 years, 23 years this summer, actually. I started with him two days after I graduated from university, uh, working at Leighton Orient when he owned the football club. Uh, I was 21. And then when I was 26, he made me chief executive of the football club, which was a bit of a baptism of fire. <laughs> it was difficult. I wasn't from a business background. I wanted to be a journalist. I was a sports reporter, really, and, and radio commentator, which I loved. Live radio, there's no bigger buzz yeah. than live radio, delivering that. Just jumping but, in there quickly on mm. that because it's interesting. Is that something that comes through that group then? Because when we spoke with Frank Smith, you know, now CEO mm. of Match and Boxing, yeah. another very young person, yeah. started young, built up, and then given the opportunity. It was back then when Match was a lot smaller. You know, we, we would only recruit junior members of staff back then. You know, we're a lot bigger now and we, we can't, we, although we do promote from within as much as we can, we do have to bring in more senior personnel now. So that's been a change in the times. But yeah, certainly like, you know, people like myself, Frank, a lady called Emily who runs the nine ball pool, 
you know, have, have all started. It's pretty much their first and only job has, has been working for, for Matchroom. So, you know, Steve, Steve Dawson, who runs the snooker, has been working for Barry for nearly 40 years. Yeah. You know, I think I, I'm there, I'm, I say I'm 22 years and I don't think I'm in the top 10 of longest serving staff. Really? Which is, you know, quite remarkable in the modern in the modern. Oh, it's probably testament to the success of the company. Maybe, yeah, and also that you know that how enjoyable it is to work yeah. for the company. But yeah, so I, I was at Lake Orient, and then I, I became chief executive of the PDC in two thousand and eight. So just quickly before, yeah, I was running a football club at the age of twenty six. That was great. I loved. It. I mean, I'm an Orient <laughs> fan. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the board there now still, um, and uh, I, I love Lake Orient, you know, and and I like to think my contribution to the club has been a good one over the years you know we've had a number of promotions we've got to Wembley um you know I think when when Barry owned it we did it in a very certain way um in terms of we knew how much money we were going to lose each year and it was up to us to make sure we could finish as high up the table for that money we didn't chase we didn't we didn't put the club at risk we didn't borrow some fans didn't like it they thought we weren't spending enough money but most fans actually understood we were living within our means and we were doing what was right for the club um, Barry sold it in 2014 and, and I left then um, the person he sold it to kind of almost killed it to be yeah. brutally honest and then I worked with the current owners uh, to buy it back in 2017 and since then you know we've managed to get back from the National League to League One which has been personally I feel a huge amount of redemption from that because where we left the club in in 2014 having just lost on penalties to get into the championship at the, in the playoff final to then see it on its knees in the National League was just devastating. Yep. You know, I just couldn't deal with that. So to see us now back in the top half of League One, well run, stable, great fan engagement, you know, positive mood around Brisbane Road on a match day is something I take a lot of pride from. Yep. I've not been a, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say I've been the driving force behind it, but I like to think I've played a, a you know, a part in it a, along the way. And that for me means a lot because it, it was, I didn't enjoy seeing the club yep. in, in the state it was in. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, my job on the darts has continued, and and I'm sorry, that was know. so 2017. So 2017, I went back into Orient as a non-exec director, but but essentially, I've been chief exec of the PDC since the end of 2007, start of 2008. So that's you know what 16 years now. Yeah, I think the main the main difference, if I look back on where we are now, and where we were then, is the internationalism, okay. internationalisation rather of, of of the sport. Um, everything used to be pretty much UK based. We'd do an event in Vegas, which was essentially a glorified holiday for a lot of people. <laughs> and you know, it's totally different now. It's totally different. You know, I mean, we're we're on an aeroplane every week, and we're we're growing the sport. We're taking it to new markets. We're breaking down barriers, and and um, you know, it's really gratifying mm -hmm. to see because we want to we want to get to the level of golf and tennis and be a truly global sport. That is a a big driving factor for us, and and one that you know. We're, we're totally focused on achieving. And I think we'll get there. Yeah. Well, geographically, where, where do you see is the biggest opportunity? I think probably from, from in, if you look proportionately from where we are to where we can get to, Southeast Asia is massive. There's, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of players, Japan, Philippines, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand. The, these countries are stacked with dart players and a lot of them are very talented. The challenge for them at the moment is if they want to be professional, they've got to relocate to Europe probably haven't got the resources to do that we need to offer them opportunities in their own territory where they can get play more competitive darts more mm -hmm. regularly and, and develop their own standards so we were doing quite well at that pre-covid we had world series events in japan and china the world cup teams from that part of the world were, were, were beating european countries and doing well covid set set that part of the world back for a long time um, and although it came out of it sort of back end of 22 really it was only last year that we really got our Asian tour up and running again. And only now that we're starting to see those players, you know, go on and compete um, at a high level again. They're open to anybody. You pay a small entry fee and then there's $10,000 prize money per event. Yeah. Um, but they're a route into our bigger tournaments, more importantly. So a lot of the players in Japan and the Philippines in particular, they're well sponsored and well backed. They have got people behind them who will fund them to go on and, and, and play internationally. Yeah. There's a lad called Christian Perez from the Philippines who's our first Filipino tour card holder. And he's one of about six Filipinos who can easily compete, yeah. you know, on the global stage. It's just up to us to, you know, maximize the opportunities that are available for them. So you said earlier you were a promoter, not a right um, federation. Yeah, yeah. Is, is the sport on you? The decisions of the sport, the governance of the sport. The, the, yeah, the Are you technically a? <laughs> no, no, the, no. So the governance is is the Darts Regulation Authority, which is an independent body. So they look after our discipline. They look after our anti-doping, our anti-corruption. 
Um, they look after our managers and agents licensing, anything on that nuts and bolts side of the, of the sport. They keep everything clean. And we're fortunate in that darts is a clean sport generally anyway. There was a, there was a, um, a survey conducted by a corporate communications company about in, integrity in sport and darts was the rank number one in terms of public perception of cleanliness. We're, you know, we're fortunate not to have had a, an issue with drug taking or match fixing or anything like that. There's the odd minor minor thing, but we haven't had anything touch wood uh, yeah. of a major major uh, level. And I think the reason for that is that the players understand where the sport is and where it's going compared to where it was. And they respect that, that the sport is growing and the responsibility is on them to deliver a clean sport that the people who are paying good money to watch either on TV or live in the arena can trust. Sports, if you look at sports, and a lot of them are traditional Olympic sports that have struggled with integrity over recent years because of drug taking or match fixing, you know, track and field, cycling, swimming. These sports reputations have been destroyed mm. by the participants within them, not respecting the sport that they're in. You know, and I, I, and I think we're fortunate in darts that the players understand their responsibility and their job is to go up there and try their best and be clean it while they're doing yeah. so. Yeah. What, um, because you're also chair of match and multi-sport. Mm -hmm. right? Match and multi-sport includes what? So a multi-sport is, is our, is, it's evolved a lot over the last few years and it essentially it's nine ball pool now. So we've, we've launched a global nine ball pool tour, which in the UK may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but when you look at uh, Central Europe, when you look at Asia, Southeast Asia, when you look at the US, it's a big deal. There's a huge number of pool players, a huge number, and they play for big money. Um, the TV coverage is growing from quite a small base, but nine ball is is the version of pool that we, we whatever, whichever sport we go into, we want to make sure it's simple so the people, the public can understand mm. it. And so nine ball pool, which is the nine foot by four and a half foot uh, table, the diamond of balls where you have to fin you win the rack by potting the num the nine ball. It's not reds v yellows. It's not the small English pool um, pub table. But nine ball pool is the global version of pool. It's the, it's the version that is understood all around the world. And it's an exciting game to watch and an exciting game to play. So it's probably where darts was 20 years ago. So it's quite an exciting journey for, for the people that are working on that to, to be at the start of. We like to move into a bit of quick fire stuff as well. Go for as it. you get towards the end, which is always <laughs> more fun. But I mean, they never turn out to be that quick fire. <laughs> um, what do you say is the biggest challenge that you face within the sport? Our biggest challenge at the moment is probably the the way the broadcast market's evolving, and that, you know it's important for us to make sure that we're front and centre of that because we know we deliver good numbers, but we also deliver a huge amount of content, and we have to make sure that we're we're doing that in the right way to to reach the mo the most eyeballs um, that we can in each territory. Because the relationship with Sky is that is that really driven by Matrim as a whole. Because there was wasn't there a breakaway with boxing? Well, boxing. And Sky, so, so, so matching boxing was previously with Sky Sports and is now yeah. with the Zone. But to be brutally honest, the numbers that the darts delivers for Sky that's the main driver for them. Yeah. Commercially, yes, we have the endemic sponsorships, the ones that directly associate. What category or area would you really like to start building into your kind of commercial vehicle within darts? I'd like to. I'd like us to get a sponsor from the financial services world. Because I think from a credibility perspective, I think it's good. And I also think we could deliver really good value for them. If you look at certain sports, the perception is maybe that it's rich. It's a rich person's sport and it's an elite sport and things like that. But normal people have money too. And they need to know what to do with that money and how to spend it and how to save it and how to invest it and how to maximize their value on it. So don't overlook that just because, you know, we're not a sailing regatta or a 10 million pound golf event over four days you know there's there's well, you asked me earlier about perception and i don't think we have a perception issue with the public but i think we have a perception issue in the corporate world where sometimes they're quite quick to look past darts they're they're, they're maybe a bit snobby and a bit frightened of darts but they shouldn't be because they'll probably find if they looked under the bonnet that most of their customers are darts mm. fans. The brand association type thing is a, yeah. a concern for them. Yeah, you think? yeah, I would say so maybe, yeah. Unlike yeah. it is in some of the other sports that, that you have yeah. within the group. Where where our numbers will be will eclipse what other properties that they partner with yeah. uh, can deliver for them. 
and we'll probably be a lot cheaper as well. But it's that perception. Are you happy with your league structure? Take out the World Championship. Are you happy with the Global um, Darts calendar? Yeah, there's anyway? always things to evolve. We Our calendar is absolutely jam-packed and it's a, that's a challenge for us. Actually, probably that's that's probably should have been the answer for for when you said to me what's the biggest the biggest challenge is there's not enough weeks in the year to deliver the number of events that we want to deliver so we're always looking to evolve our events and improve them and the certain ideas we've got in the pipeline at the moment for 2025 with our existing events that we think will improve them but the key for us is how we can deliver as many events as we can in each market without overexposing and, and oversaturating so in the uk we're probably delivering enough events as we are at the moment. In Germany, we're probably delivering enough events as, as we are at the moment. But in Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, Africa, America, Scandinavia, mm. there's probably scope for us to deliver more events. So it's how we, how we adjust our structure. Because ultimately, Luke Humphreys and Michael Van Gerwen and Luke Littler and Gerwin Price and all the other top, top guys they can't be in two places at once and they need to have time off. And you know we encourage them to, to manage their schedules in that way. Mm. But in the same vein, we want to give them as many opportunities as possible to earn as much money as possible. We talked about challenges. What about the needle moving opportunities that, that you have at the moment? And particularly back to what we said at the start, really taking advantage of this wave that's, that's kind of swept through. Yeah, well, I think now's the right time for us to be, to be opening up doors into new markets. You know, and, the, and the approaches that we've had from promoters and venues around the world since the World Championship kind of back that up. Yeah. You know, now now's the time for us to be brave, to try things. You know, we know where we're strong and we know where, you know, where we can deliver. But there's there's a whole world out there that we'd maybe not considered before that we should now be looking at. Finally. One four seven, nine data, a hole in one in golf. What's the hardest? What's the hardest? Most people say a one four seven because it's the most the most number of number of shots, isn't it? I mean, I'd I'd like to think I could get a hole in one if I was a bit lucky. I, I couldn't get a nine data. I've got no chance of getting a one four seven. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. There's a few people out there claiming to have done all three. They're all lying, by the way. They are all lying. And you know who you are, and you're all lying. Do you enjoy doing media? Do you enjoy going and talking about the sport? Yeah, I think because of my background as a as a journalist, which I was for the first, you know, five or six years of my career, I'm used to asking questions as well as answering them. Sometimes can make me a little bit guarded perhaps you know I, I firmly believe if you tell someone the truth that's all they can ask for it doesn't matter if it's not the answer they want as long as you can look them in the eyes and say i'm telling you the truth and i'm making this decision for genuine reasons then that's as good as you can give people it's when you start hiding covering things up blustering that's when it becomes difficult and i try and do that i get interviewed a lot by the darts um, websites and YouTube channels and things like that and a lot of the time you know some of the fans they hate the, the decisions we've made about formats and things like that but once you've explained it they go okay I don't like it but I get it you know, and that's all you can ask for in people so I think my background in journalism has helped me um, you know when, when I've gone on to the other side of the mic and it's probably part of you know now the opportunity again as I said to bring just better light to the whole tour totally now. you know I mean I think the exposure that darts is getting now is, is a great thing even the garbage clickbait that we're subject to most of the time is is is, is a positive because I'd far rather be having that issue than uh, nobody talking about us at all. Yeah, you know. So it's just about harnessing it. It's about we've got a great product. We've got a product that people really enjoy. That people can engage with, and importantly, they can dip in and dip out. You know, we're not saying to you buy a season ticket and come every week. We're saying that we'll come to your town. Just come once a year. Just enjoy it once a year. But then when we've gone away again, follow us on Twitter. Have a look at our, our, our Instagram feed. Just give us your email address and we'll send you emails. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. No problem. But everybody likes it. So we're in a great place. Matt, I've really loved doing this. Thanks thank you so much. Me too. It's been really great to Pleasure. get under the hood of uh, the sport. So thank you. Welcome.